Oscar, only you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, truly. You're I'm lying. I am lying. I'm terrible. Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host, Oscar Fuchs. Today's special compilation episode from season two is all about where people get their news and information from about China. And in case you didn't hear the wrap-up episode from season two back in September, I should inform you now that this is the last time we will be hearing guests of the show answering this particular question. When I first thought it up, I imagined this question would lead to discussions over a wide variety of specialist magazines and periodicals, reflecting the specific industries or artistic fields represented by the guests on the show. And there are some answers like this, but as news and journalism around the world gets more consolidated, more digitalized, and more aggregated onto social media, I can foresee that the scope for discussion around this topic will continue to get narrower and narrower in the future. With this in mind, from next season onwards, I'll be broadening the question to include any source of inspiration, rather than just sources of news and information about China. Sorry to all the news junkies out there. Please consider today's episode your one final hit. Stefan Wime, the head of consumer insights at L'Oréal, from episode one, China Daily. Uh, some of my friends or some acquaintances they they find this really strange, but I think that the business section of the China Daily, there is not a day when I don't learn something, a, a statistic, a number, an insight. It's really interesting.、Mm. Um, for instance,、uh, in today's business section of the China Daily, while private companies contribute to sixty percent of China's GDP. They're responsible for 70% of innovation, 80% of urban employment, and they provide 90% of new jobs. So you see, there's always a little something to learn. Douglas C, the island businessman from episode 15, Shanghai Daily, because because there's so many sources of media, different opinions, but at least with Shanghai Daily, I know what the government wants to happen, and with that. It's easier for me to align my business decisions. Alex Shower, the clean energy entrepreneur, from episode eleven. So I'm、uh, very impressed with how South China Morning Post has stepped up their reporting, and just I feel like they've really done a nice job of reaching the international audience. So I do tend to get my China news from SCMP, but、um, I also really do and en- still enjoy the Shanghai Daily just to get my little daily dose of what's going on locally. It is really helpful to understand the perspective on the ground. Murray King, the public affairs leader, from episode twenty nine. I try to look at everything I can. So South China Morning Post is a great way to get some of the mainland news in a less filtered way.、Uh, strangely enough, I like Shanghai Daily. Their metro news is great.、Mm. It's a great way to get a fix on local news.、Um, Sinocism、yeah. uh, is great.、Um, Shanghai Fabu, the Shanghai Information Office. Everybody should have Shanghai Fabu on their WeChat、um, as a subscription. And you know, the best news I get is just what I see and hear. Casey Hall, the fashion journalist from episode twenty-two. Because of my work, I get a lot of、um, newspaper subscriptions paid for, which is great. But there is one that I pay for myself, which I feel like is a glowing endorsement of how important I find it. If I'm willing to fork over money for it, it's called Cynicism, Bill Bishop.、Oh, yes, yes.、Um, so I pay an annual fee for that, and I open it every day and, and read it every day because it just gives such a wide-ranging roundup of what's happening in China. You know, you're getting a, a fantastic curation. Crystal Mo, the fine dining expert from episode twenty-six. Well, I do love the more long-form writing about China in the New Yorker. So I will read their essays written by some of the top writers, like Peter Hessler. AJ Jane, the car designer from episode twenty-one. Sitting and drawing cars all day, I've got a lot of time to listen to things. I can multitask that, and I started with audio books and I got into podcasting. So I listen to a hell of a lot of stuff. 
there's uh, obviously mosaic of China now. <laughs> <sighs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I subscribe to The Economist and I listen to the whole Economist cover to cover and that has a very, very good mm. uh, China section. Mm. There's the Seneca podcast, which is very good. BBC News always seems to have something on China, but yeah. for me, the, the Economist uh, China sections, every week you get the best bits. Sean Harmon, the beer company CEO from episode nine. I was actually just this morning listening to the new uh, Seneca Business Brief. It's a, I think it's a weekly podcast. It's like 20 minutes and it just updates you on all that's happening in the world of China business. Michael Kinsey, the fire engineer from episode 25. Scientific journals, there's fire technology. Ooh. Um, yeah, generally, um, I don't read the news as much since uh, being here. Mm. I, I've just noticed it takes up a lot of time developing opinions about things I don't necessarily <laughs> need to have. Yes. So I try to find a variety of sources. Um, so uh, the South China Morning Post, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, uh, things like that. Cassandra Chun, the heavy metal bar owner from episode 16. There is a magazine uh, called a Painkiller. Painkiller. Yeah, it's like a heavy metal magazine. It's still the only one in China. And they help Wagen Festival. It's, a, it's like a German heavy metal festival. They do that once a year. Like one of the biggest heavy metal festival in Europe. Vittorio Francese, the lawyer from episode 27. So I, I know what's happening uh, because I read maybe the, the first page of a, of a Chinese newspaper and I analyze the, the point of view of the Chinese press. I've been watching CGTN sometimes. I read China Wire and China Insights. Ji Yong, the transgender teacher from episode 30. I think it's really important you go directly from the organization itself because when these things get reported on in many large media organizations, um, some of the small touches to things are not fully understood or explained. And so I think getting it directly from the people who collected the data is the most legitimate. Joe McFarland, the product sourcing leader from episode 18. Well, we ask our factories because they're really well informed. So even things, if we said to them, where do you think exchange rate's going to be in six months? You honestly get a good answer. (laughs) You get a much better answer than if you asked our treasury because they are actually, their fingers are on the pulse out here. And we have a lot of factories that are connected to the government. So we do tend to get very good information from our network. Björn Dahlman, the Swedish clown from episode 17. I try to listen to friends from different places. Like, I have my Chinese friends who rely on what they hear from their friends. And I have my Chinese friends who really, like, you know, try to dig into things. And I have my my American friends, my English friends, my Australian friends, my Swedish friends. So I, I try to hear all the stories, but then I'm also trying to be critical. But I, yes. I must say, I'm not that interested in understanding it every day, but rather put this in a 20-year perspective. You have to be informed to a certain extent because that is your obligation as a citizen. And then it's up to me when I want to dig deeper. Vladimir Jurovic, the brand naming expert from episode 13. I got curated content twice a week at the occasion of my Chinese class because uh, my Chinese teacher uh, will pick up the curated content from the news and we will be having a review of very good content. And so I'm learning language, but actually I'm learning a whole story of topics. DJ B.O., the DJ from episode 23. I'm really interested in the history of Shanghai nightlife. There's the Andrew Field book, Shanghai Nightscapes. Super useful. Very cool. Yovana Zhang, the handicraft designer from episode eight. Books, it's gonna be books about crafts. Uh, there is a very nice series from uh, the, the research of uh, Hua Yun Sung that um, he's designing them by themselves. It's, it's really incredible sense of research, uh, humor, and uh, all together in, in, at once. 
Coco Santi, the drag performer from episode 5. Oh my god, get ready for this. There is a website called Dan Dan Zan. Oh, right. Yeah, you really, really need to use it, especially if you don't have access to a lot of film and television online. This website uh, gives you the access to watch a variety of television shows. Oh, it's got a good library, has it? Oh, it has the best. You will never have a problem finding something you want to watch on Dan Dan Zan. Wow. <laughs> Michelle Chu, the improvisational comedian from episode 20. My favorite is Billy Billy. I have never used it. What, what is Billy Billy? Oh, you should use it. It's really a loving platform. <laughs> it's a video platform. Movies, documentary movies, and just the short videos. Up Zhu, up owners. Oh. They make videos by themselves. Mm. So people will give their own understand. Catherine Wong, the Peruvian healer from episode 4. I am not a person who reads news, but if I read something, it will be from the Shanghai East. They have funny news. Yeah, I don't think anyone's mentioned the Shanghai East before. Yeah, they do a good job. Yeah, very entertaining. Louise Roy, the childbirth and lactation specialist from episode 6. Oscar, only you. Yeah, I mean, truly. <laughs> You're lying. I am lying, but I'm terrible. I really just pick from whatever I get my hands on. I don't have a set favorite sauce. Nonolo Bengu, the African community organizer from episode 14. None. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more seriously, I especially like, you know, when we were being informed what's changing, what's not changing during lockdown, what, you know, what's being lifted, what isn't being lifted. I would always confirm with a friend who works in an international school. So whatever sources she would be using seemed to be true. Mm, so mm. that's what I would do, just like yeah. cross-reference with her. Yeah, that's useful, actually. I'm the same because I do dip into certain news sources and, of course, mm. I check WeChat. But then when it comes from someone who has a direct link to something official, then mm -hmm. you listen. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Jamie Barris, the street food expert from episode two. So in our office right now, because we've had, you know, so many people stuck out, we actually have a bunch of empty desks. So I've had a couple friends who are journalists who are actually allowed to work from home but have children, so they need to be able to work from a place with no kids either. Um, so that's actually been like my recent source. I'm just like, what's going on in the world, guys? Do I need to know anything? Salome Chun the investor and developer from episode 24. I have a lot of people who work in the media fields on my moments. I lived in Beijing, so I know a lot of people there who get to know certain things. And you know, in Beijing, you have the rumors, different kind of rumors all around. So I get trained. You hear something, you analyze with your experience, you do some research by yourself, yeah, I try not to read so many Chinese media. Wendy Saunders, the architect from episode 12. Um, WeChat is actually a very good source of news, or is it gossip? I don't really know. But um, <laughs> you realize you know everything you know goes through WeChat. Mm. And you sometimes forget that people outside of China don't. Zhao Huiling, the Africa travel vlogger from episode 28. I rely a lot on social media. So Gong Zhong Hao is how I get a lot of my information. I go on Weibo every now and then, and that's about it. Dan Majid, the Tibetan social enterprise leader from episode 10. I mean, WeChat is big. I use it a lot. But also like uh, uh, WeChat recently has channels. I really like that mm. because like my WeChat friends like something, then I can also receive the similar feed. So that's that's so interesting. And yeah, that's a new thing. Yeah. Mm. Zhang Yuan, the performance art exhibitor from episode seven. I have to confess, I read no more papers. I mean, journals, magazines, all these sort of things. Yeah. I spend most of the time to get information through social media. Yeah. 
And uh, so even in a specific niche like contemporary art, everyone still just relies on WeChat, yeah, right? Yeah, there are periodicals, but I don't think people are reading it mm. seriously. Mm. But people will take a look, but uh, they will not spend much time on it. Seth Harvey, the education coach from episode 19. I, of course, use Smart Shanghai. Like, that's my number one go-to thing. I read everything. Mm. I read every article. I'm looking at what events are going on. Like, um, I even have, like, a pastime like hobby of I love going through all the apartment listings. I'm basically an uncertified apartment agent. I can tell you what the market value of things are and how the market's doing. I even love going through the, the classifieds. And secondly, I use WeChat quite a lot. I am the biggest lurker of group chats. Oh. I lurk in so many group chats. I get all of this information inside. People are like, how do you know that? Group chat. Yeah. Um, everything from uh, foodie and restaurant groups to exercise, uh, cooking, um, social events. Uh, I'm even in a dad's group. <laughs> so there's a group for like expat fathers, like a big one. And they talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, and I have no kids and I don't really remember how I, someone put me into this group, but I never left and I just lurk and I get so much great information from that. <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you've reached this far, then you've made it to the end. I try to inject as much fun as possible into the show, but there's no denying that the topic of news and information sources is always going to be kind of dry. So congratulations on making it through what's probably going to be the driest of these 10 special compilation episodes from Season 2. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. And I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, hey, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's my pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>